I want to ask you this question. If you could do something impossible, what would it be? Or maybe it would be some exploit for God. Something that God's laid on your heart. Maybe if you could do something impossible, it would be in the realm of a relationship. What would it be that you'd like God to do that's impossible? Well, I have wonderful news for you tonight. God wants to do the impossible for you, his child. People that don't have God or his power do great things all the time. God doesn't call you to do great things. God calls you to do impossible things. Listen to these few quotes. I love them dearly. A.W. Tozer, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. I love this next sentence. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. George Mueller, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. The great missionary Amy Carmichael to India. When you're facing the impossible, you can count on the God of the impossible. I love this quote from Warren Wearsby. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and to expect what seems impossible. D.L. Moody, if God is your partner, make your plans big and impossible. We say, Brother Gibbs, those are the words of men. Well, listen to these verses. Jeremiah 22, 17, O Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth, and by thy great power stretched out thine arm. There is nothing Nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything, he asks, that's too hard for me? Matthew 19, 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Have you ever noticed we stop talking about the impossible? And yet we serve the God of the impossible. All of us at some point in our life have had our backs to the wall and we think, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know which way to turn. What shall I do? We've had our backs to the wall and everything looked rather impossible. It looks impossible for us to be able to get through this without a great deal of pain or hurt. Looks impossible for us to get through this without some real financial problems developing. It looks impossible for us to be healed after what the doctor said. So there are all kinds of situations we come into. The first thing I want you to notice here is this, and that is that Jesus is aware of those circumstances in which we feel it is a seemingly impossible situation. You notice I didn't say an impossible situation, but seemingly impossible. It appears to be impossible. It looks like it's impossible. For example, when you and I hit one of those difficult situations in life, or we our backs to the wall, or we think something looks impossible, what do we say? We say, oh Lord, what am I going to do? Wrong question. Now remember, this is real important, because you're going to get one of these. Lord, what, what, what am I going to do? What in the world am I going to do? How many of us have asked that? Oh, God, what in the world am I going to do? That's not the right question. The right question is, Lord, what are you going to do? Nothing is impossible when the supernatural invasion of God by the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our life and he enters our circumstance to deal with them. If I and I alone have to deal with them, I'm going to have a problem. But if he begins to deal with them, he, if I allow him, 
if I acknowledge him, if I call upon him into my circumstance, he is going because of his compassion and love to deal with that circumstance no matter what it is. And oftentimes we wonder why things don't happen right. We wonder why, why we can't figure it out. God doesn't want us figuring it out. He wants us to rely upon him, to trust in him, and as, as he says, to call upon him. Not only is he aware of our circumstance, but listen, he always, listen, he always has a plan for our seemingly impossible circumstances. That is, Jesus is never caught off guard. That is, he always knows what he's going to do, and he knows how he's going to do it, and he knows how, where, when, and he knows exactly the resources that are necessary. No matter what you're facing in life, he knows exactly what to do. So I'm, I'm going to stop my calculation. I'm going to start trusting and see what you do. You'll be amazed at what God can turn around in your life. So we want to seek God for the impossible. Believe God for miracles. Dream that God would do more in our lives than we ever imagined for his glory and our good. So let's lay the foundation for this by looking at two different stories about Jesus. And what's interesting is that Jesus was amazed at two different times for two different reasons. Story one, Jesus is in his own hometown and people were being critical of him for saying who he was. They said, who does this man say he is? People wondered, they didn't like it. In Mark six, verse five through six, it says he could not do many mighty miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith as to who he said he was. Story number two, this is a Roman centurion, but this centurion had a sick servant. He goes to Jesus and asks Jesus to heal his servant. That centurion believed that Jesus could heal the servant with just a single word. Luke 7, verse 9. When Jesus heard this from the Roman centurion, he was amazed. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Two different times Jesus was amazed. Lack of faith, great faith. So question and only you can answer this. If Jesus looked at your faith level, would he be amazed at how big, how audacious and bold your faith is? Or would he be amazed how small it is and how lacking it is? Think about this last year. What great faith steps did you take in any area this past year? Did you attempt something so bold, maybe a bit risky, that you could not have pulled off without God. How about your prayer life? What did you pray for? What if God answered every one of your prayers? What would be different in the world? Here's what's sad. For many, many Christians, nothing would be different because they didn't pray, didn't take any action. They weren't bold. And God says, I can do all things. And you don't even try. Would God be amazed at your great faith? are amazed at your lack of faith. Nothing is impossible with God because he has no failures. We don't read in the Bible where God tried really, really hard, but it didn't work out. Nothing is impossible with God because he always understands. Listen, right now, the problem that is absolutely tormenting your head, God already knows what the answer is. He knows who the answer is. He knows where the answer is. He knows how to fix it. He knows how to change things. The problem is we measure God's ability by our ability because we can't do it, because we don't know it, because we've never experienced it. We somehow, we lump God in with us and we think God is up there going, I hear you. Absolutely, it's not going to work. You know what we do? We measure by our understanding. When we face a problem in marriage or health or finances or children or whatever's going on in life, often what we want to know is how. How could this possibly work out? John 6, 8 and 9. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up saying, there is a boy here with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go 
among so many. That, that, that's the problem. He's trying to work it out. The one, two, three, multiply by, get out the calculator. No, I, I don't get it, Jesus. How can it possibly work out? I don't understand it. Faith doesn't mean you have to understand how. How exactly is God going to supply it? You're not required to understand. You're required to believe. God helps us in areas of life that are impossible because he knows later on you're going to face more impossible situations. And he wants you to be able to look back. That's why when, when the 5,000 men plus women and children, when they were all fed miraculously, the Bible says there were leftovers. Twelve baskets. How many disciples? Twelve. Each of them carried a basket full. Why? Because for the rest of their life, if they came up against another impossible situation, they would remember the time that God did a miracle so big there were leftovers. I want you to look in Matthew chapter 14. God says, you want me to do the impossible. He gives us a lesson here. It's the story of Peter walking on the water. We're going to start at verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained the disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. But the ship, now the disciples, in verse 24, was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. The disciples are in a ship, Jesus has put them in it, and they are in a hellacious storm, a fierce storm. A storm that has these disciples, including the mariners, terrorized. Now look at what happens. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him, verse 26, walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Now somebody is going to ask God for the impossible. Oh, they've seen the impossible. That's how he fed the 5,000. But now they're going to ask for the impossible. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Here's the first key. You got to ask. You got to ask for the impossible. You see what Peter did, Lord? Bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, all the disciples were in that boat, all of them. But only one asked. But because one man asked, God did the impossible. When's the last time you asked specifically? Uh, in James, where it says, ask and you shall receive. It's the word for asking with specificity. When's the last time you asked for the impossible? What are you asking for? What impossible thing do you want to see God do? And my God says, ask in faith, believing, and ye shall receive. Do you understand? It's not you who's going to do the impossible. It's God through you who's going to do the impossible. If you think it's you who's going to pull it off, then you've got a vanity problem. Do you understand how powerful your ask is? Or has the devil bankrupted your faith? Got you believing that your ask isn't going to make a lick of difference. Ask in faith believing and ye shall receive. You should have a list of impossible things you're asking for but you got to ask. 
You want God to do the impossible, number one, you got to ask. Number two, you got to get your eyes off of the storm. Now catch this. If I'd have been in the boat, I think I'd have said, Jesus, I want to go water walking, but could you stop this storm? Uh, could you get the circumstances better, please? God's not going to fix the circumstances. That's what man does. Okay, Brother Howell, here's what we want to do. Now, how do we fix this mess? God says, once you leave the mess in my hands, you got to get your eyes off of the storm. The storm in your life is no reason to not ask God for the impossible. You know what the devil says? Yeah. <laughs> He may do the impossible for her or him, but you? And you got your eyes paralyzed by the circumstances. Get your eyes off of the storm. The storm does not control the power of God. God's power controls the storm. It's never the right time to do the impossible. Never. Well, let, let's wait a year. It'll still be impossible. And circumstances don't govern the power of your God. Listen, you can trust him. Read Hebrews 11. Not one of them had a safety net. Not one of them. We say, man, I want God to use me. Not one person in scripture had a safety net. What they had was God. You got to get rid of a plan B. Now, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you're the God of the impossible. But just in case you don't come through, I want you a little closer. Because if somehow I start sinking, I want to grab the boat. The boat is my plan B. Get rid of your plan B. You got to step out. Look at what it says there. Verse 29, and he said, Come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You realize God could have levitated him right up and over, but he didn't. Peter had to step out. What would it take for you to step out? You'll never reach your potential playing safe. God wants you to try something so that it isn't possible at all unless God comes through. And that's scary. And most of us want to hug security. Peter's a great example. He was in a boat when Jesus was walking on the water in a storm that threatened these seasoned fishermen. And he called to Peter and Peter got out and for a little bit walked on the water. And then people think because Peter failed, well, he sank, so he failed. But there were 11 other bigger failures who never got out of the boat. There are people who think that failing means you're missing God. I've discovered that failing is often the first step to discovering God. Never let the fear of failure stop you from taking a step of faith. What happens if we go out and start a business? I don't know. It's called faith. Wise counsel, prayer, but it's still risky, which is why most people want to guarantee now, some of you are playing it safe and you know it. The writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 11, verse 1, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see yet. And the problem for many of us is we want to guarantee. But the reality is God doesn't operate that way. Sorry, you can have faith or you can have control, but you can't have both. Sometimes you have to just say, I think God is calling me to do this. You've prayed about it. You've got wise counsel. You're not violating scripture. And you say, I think God wants us to do this. Nothing wrong with that. And you say, well, what if I fail? Well, what if you do? Get back up. You know, though the righteous man falls seven times, the Lord will uphold him. Don't be so afraid to fail. You don't live. Some of you have to let go of control so you can take a step of faith. God isn't going to show you steps three, four, and five till you take step one. You got to take the first step. 
and some of you have to take some faith risks. To step towards my destiny, I have to step away from my security, my paycheck, my guaranteed whatever. I'm going to have to take a risk. And that's what separates the men from the boys. It's not that they're any better. They just took the risk. You may wonder what's going to happen. But if you knew, it wouldn't be called faith. Who knows what you're capable of? To try and fail is not as bad as never to try at all. Right? I want you to do something you haven't done before. If you want something you never had, you got to do something you've never done. And if you do, you're not comfortable because you've never done it before. You don't have any security to hold on to. There are people in this room sitting on something you'd like to do, but you're afraid to do it. I know it. I know it. There's something, and it's been in you for a couple of years. Maybe starting your own business. Maybe uh, develop, changing a career. You might have to step back for a season to go forward. It's okay. And it takes faith in order to bring those changes about. It's not foolish. It isn't without counsel. It isn't without prayer. But at the end of the day, you're the one that has to take the risk, cut the safety line, and step on the water. And nothing's going to happen until you get out of that boat. Now, some of you will go to the grave wondering, I wonder if I'd done that. I wonder if I'd just quit that. And I wonder if I'd have started that. And you'll never know till you do. You will never know. And so don't complain about where you are if you're not willing to take some step of faith to change it. Now, what I want you to remember is this. Don't ever underestimate what God can do in your life when you surrender all you are and all you have to Him. I am fully persuaded that one of the primary reasons that so many people are discouraged with their life, sort of looking at life and thinking, well, am I important? I'll never be able to accomplish anything, never be able to amount to anything. In other words, just sort of discouraged about their life. Most people, probably. When they look at their lives, they don't see a lot going on. Could it be it's because you have never turned it over to the one who created you. Yield it to the one who wants to work in you and reveal to you and show you what he can do, what he will do with your life if you'll give yourself to him. Most people are selfish. They have their life in their own grip. This is the way I want to live. This is the way I'm going to live. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to have. This is where I'm going. And so their life is their own plan. And what they don't realize is this that God has the best plan possible for your life. But the only way he can make that plan work is for you to open your hands, surrender your life to him, and give yourself to him absolutely and totally. Now, that is a matter of pure trust. Do you believe that God has the best plan? Absolutely. Are you willing to allow him to demonstrate to you the best plan? Most people aren't. And so what they've done they have locked themselves into their own puny plan when God has the best. But you must open yourself to him to see what could God do with me. God specializes in things that seem impossible. He knows a thousand ways to make a way for you. But when we let go and let God have his way, his wonderful way in our life, it takes simple childlike faith to place your trust in him. And watch what he does in your life.